George Lewis is a fantastic Rotarian. He's received many awards. He was a pro baseball player at one time, and he was a stockbroker. He has uh, great many accomplishments in the world, but the biggest thing is being a philanthropist in Rotary and inspiring people to help save lives through clean water. I'd like to respectfully ask George Lewis to make his presentation today. Hmm. Thank you, Phyllis. Life. Life should be an exciting adventure. You should wake up every morning and say, Rotary, thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to serve, to give something back to the community, to help the less fortunate people around the world to have a better life. I think that's why most people join Rotary. They want to do good. They want to make the world a better place. But unfortunately, a lot of Rotarians are like a lot of people. They really, really want to do good, but they just never get around to doing it. Why is it? I think the reason is that they're in a box. I call this a conformity box. Now, when you're in a conformity box, you don't like change. You fear failure. You don't like to take any risks. But you know what? Most people that are in a conformity box, they're happy. So if you're happy, I don't have any problem with that. But if you want to soar like an eagle, you got to get out of that box. In order to get out of that box, you have to be able to do one very important thing. You have to be able to take action on those things that you really want to do. You must say, well, huh, that's easy. I can do that. In reality, it's not very easy. Let's say you go to the doctor and you're 50 pounds overweight and the doctor says to you, you know what, if you don't lose those 50 pounds, you're gonna die. You say, wait, wait a minute, I don't wanna die. So you say, I'm gonna go on a diet. And then you start thinking about all the great things that are gonna happen when, when you lose all that weight, I'll feel good. I'll look better, I'll get a lot of new clothes. My friends will be saying, what a great job you did. And you have less chance of getting a stroke or diabetes or even dying. You can go on and on and on with all of these benefits. But then why? Why do people let go on a diet? Why don't they lose the weight? I think the reason is they don't look at the other side of the equation. I call this these rotten stick and deterrents that want to sabotage your goal. So if you want to lose weight, you got to give up beer and martinis pasta, desserts. You got to get on a treadmill for a half hour, walk around a block 10 times, and you have to drink eight glasses of water every day. Now, if these things are so powerful that they outweigh the benefits, you will not be able to take action on those things you really want to do. So if you have to want to do something, you got to get rid of those negatives. You got to beat them with a stick, minimize them, or else you're not going to be able to do what you want to do. When I was growing up, all I wanted to do was to be a major league baseball player. And I must say with due modesty, I was, I was pretty good. High school, I was all state. College, I was all American. The army, I was all army. And the first First year in the Boston Red Sox organization, I led the entire organization in home runs. I said, I'm on my way. I'm, I'm going to make it. So one day, one day I'm out in the field and the manager comes up to me and says, hey, George, we got a new bonus baby in town. We want you to be his mentor, his roommate. He says, get out of here. I can hardly take care of myself. He says, come on, George, you got to help us. You, you got to do this. I said, okay. What's his name? He said, Carl Yastrzemski. Now, if you know anything about baseball, you know that Carl Yastrzemski became one of the best players in the history of baseball. He's in the Hall of Fame. Well, he's my roommate. So one day I hit a home run. I, I, saw, I, I go up to Carl. I say, we got to go out tonight and celebrate. He said, nah, I'm, I'm tired. I don't want to go. Come on, Carl. You're my roommate. So I said, all right. So we go to the restaurant. Waiter comes up to me and he says, what do you drink? I said, I'll have a Budweiser. I says, Carl, what kind of beer do you want? He said, I don't want a beer, I don't want to drink, I don't drink beer. I said, what do you drink? He says, Coke, Coke, Cola. okay, so I'm drinking my beer. A few minutes later, a fan comes up and says, hey, George, nice home run, he buys me a beer. 
few minutes after that, another guy comes up, he, he, he buys me a beer. And another person buys me a beer. I get to the ballpark the next day. I'm hurting. I, 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 I can hardly see. My head is throbbing. I said, I don't know whether I can play. I look out in the outfield. Here's Carl doing sit-ups and push-ups, doing wind sprints. Needless to say, he made the major leagues and I didn't. I look back at that time in my life and I said, I really, really blew it. I was not able to take the right action on those things that I really, really wanted to do and I regret it. Back in 2006, I was living in Oregon and I was just about uh, to become president of my club and a lady came and talked about installing stoves to the poor Mayan Indians in Guatemala. And after that, she says, would anybody like to join us? I said, volunteer. So I, I said, I'll go. I had never done anything like that in my whole life. I had never volunteered and I did a humanitarian project. I never did anything like that. So I went down to Guatemala. I, I walked in, I said, it is poor Mayan Indians, they live in these little huts and they put three stones on the ground. They put the wood on the stones. That's how they cook. That's how they keep warm. But there's no windows, there's no ventilation. And then you can't see a you can't see a foot in front of your face. And you know there's girls 13, 14 years old, they got babies strapped to their back. You know those babies are gonna get sick. And some are gonna die. So we put the stove in, we put a, a, a chimney through the roof, and all of a sudden you could see the whole room. And it was fantastic. And so one day I was, I was out out and, and I'm putting a stove together, and I look up, and here's this uh, young girl, maybe 13 years old with a huge smile on her face. We couldn't communicate verbally, but I know what she was saying. She was saying, Rotary, thank you for saving my life. Saving the life of my mama, my papa, my brother, my sister, and all the people in the village, thank you. I got up off my hands and knees. I went over there and I gave her a big hug. And after that, I, when, I, when I was going away, I looked at and she still had this huge smile on her face. It changed my life. I said, I got to help these people. If, if I can, I got to help these people. When you do a grant like that, you have to have a Rotary Club in the country, a Rotary Club outside the country. So I said to them, is there a Rotarian uh, around here from your country that I can talk to? Oh, they said, yeah, yeah, we got one, Juan Carlos. He's very big in Rotary. So I go up to Juan Carlos, I said, Juan Carlos, I'm, I'm going to be president of my club in a, in, a, in a few months. What can I do to help your country? He said, oh, George. If you could supply clean drinking water, that would be fantastic. I mean, the kids are drinking water out of, out of the lakes and the rivers. It's like they're drinking mud. They're getting sick and, it's, and, they, and some are dying. It's a horrible way to die. If you could do something like that, that would be great. I said, I'll do it. I'm flying back to Oregon. I said to myself, what have I done? What have I promised to do? My, my club has been in existence for 50 years and we have never done a, a, a world community service project. We, 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 we don't have any money in our budget. I don't know how to put a grant together. I don't know what it is. And all these negative thoughts are coming through, through, through my mind. And then all of a sudden the picture of that girl comes into my mind and it's overwhelming. I said, I gotta, I gotta do this. So I called up my friend in another club and I said, you know, our club's going to do a humanitarian project to supply clean drinking water to kids in Guatemala. He said, oh, George, that's great. That's great. It's going to be a great experience. He said, how big is it? How big is the grant? I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know what to expect. I, I know he wanted me to say something big. So I said, uh, $10,000. <laughs> Excuse me. He said, no, I'm not big enough. I said, what do you mean not big enough? What, what do I got to do? He says, you got to do at least $25,000. I said, $25,000, how, how can I do that? I mean, I, I don't know, I, I, how do I get the money? He says, well, you just have to ask. Well, I was a, I was a stockbroker, I, I know how to do that. So I said, all right, I'll do that. So I, I got the uh, email addresses of all the presidents in the district, there were 72 of them. And I said, hey, you know, we're, we're doing a water project in Guatemala, a humanitarian project. I mean, it's gonna be good, we're gonna save lives and all of this, I, I said, I need your help, I need money. Well, two weeks go by, I get nothing. I said, whew, this is hard. I mean, this is hard, I said, but I'm not gonna give up. I said, come, I, I, I email him again, I said, come on guys, I need money, I need, we're gonna do a great thing here. That's what, this is where we're Rotarians. And all of a sudden, some money came in. 
and a little bit more money came in. And then all of a sudden it was funded and we, and we supplied in-house water filters to the poor people in Guatemala and we were saving lives. It was a wonderful, wonderful experience. So I said, I like that. I'm gonna do another one. So I did another one. And then I did another one. And I said, I'm gonna offer this to clubs in, in my district because I had all these people in Guatemala that were willing to help. And, and, and they started doing grants. And they're doing grants and grants. I said, I'm going to offer this to people all over the country and in Canada. So then they're doing grants. And then all of a sudden, Rotary came up. This is about several years ago. If you've been in Rotary for a long time, you'll know what I'm talking about. But they came out with this program called, called a pilot program where only 100 districts in the whole country, world could partner with each other for, for a period of three years. And I said, you know, our district wasn't going to apply. So I called up all my friends in Guatemala and I said, hey, don't apply. If you apply and they picked you, then I can't help you because we're not going to do it. We're not going to be one of those 100 districts. Well, they didn't, list, they didn't listen to me. They applied and they became one of the 100 districts. I said, I'm out of business. What am I going to do now? Just then I got a message. Somebody says, I want to be your friend. I said, hell, I don't even know you. I, I, I throw it in the garbage. Next day, I get another message. I want to be your friend. What is this? In the garbage. When I got the third message, I looked into it. It's Facebook. I'd never been on Facebook. I looked at Facebook and said, all these Rotarians, all these district governors, all these big people from Rotary, they're all on Facebook. And I said, hey, I'm back in business. I'm going to help the people all over the world. So I said, instead of Guatemala, I'll help people other places. So I don't know why, but I picked, I picked India. India is a big country with a lot of rotary districts. And I got the names of all the district governors, and I found out that they were on Facebook. And a lot of them were on Facebook. And I said, hey, you want to be my friend? And they said, of course I'll be your friend. I said, well, you want to do a water project? They said, of course I'll do a water project. I said, so this is great, we're doing water pipe. It's, it's tough dealing in India, I'm telling you. Their names are about 18 letters long. I could hardly keep up with my, I had nicknames for everybody. One guy's name was Baba Luba Lava, something like that. I said, I can't call, I can't deal with you anymore. It takes me a half hour to write your, write your name. He said, well, you can call me Bawa. I mean, so I had, I had nicknames for all of these people. So we're doing all these projects in India. And then, then I said, oh, I'm going to go to other countries. So I went to the Philippines, I went to Nigeria, I went to Lebanon. We're doing these, all these projects, all on Facebook. And, and it was wonderful. So make a long story short, since 2006, I've been able to help over 2 million less fortunate people in 37 different countries. Now I look back, I look back at that plane ride, and I could have easily have said, I can't do it. I, I just can't do it. Luckily, I was able to take the right action to do something that I really wanted to do. And that's what life's all about. You want to do something, you got to get up and you got to do it. Several years ago, several years ago, I was asked to talk at a, uh, at a PETS. So the PETS is where they train the people that are going to be presidents of their clubs in that year. This was a big PETS. It was out in out in Denver, and I think they had three or five districts involved. So there, there were a lot of people there. And I think there were like 350 president-elects. The place was on fire, jumping. I mean, these people were anxious to become president. They, they, they're just so anxious, they're all, they're, they're all on fire. I talked about water. At the end of my talk, I said, you know, if you, if you really wanna do something in water, I can help you. I can find a project. I can find a project in the country you want to deal with. I can get a host club. I can help you with the fundraising. I'll help you with the paperwork. I'll do everything. Just tell me that you have an interest. If you have an interest in something else, that's okay. But if you have an interest in water, I want to give me a card. Put it in, in this little bucket here. So after the talk, I went over to the bucket. There were 135 cards. I said, wow, that's, that's fantastic. So for a year, I bombarded them. I, I sent them projects, I sent them ideas, I sent them fundraising ideas, another project, this, that, this, I, I provided them. At the end of the year, with 135 presidents who had this once 
in a lifetime opportunity to do good, only four took me up on it and, and did a project. That means 131 presidents who had this opportunity did not have the ability to take action on something that they said they wanted to do. That's a little sad. A while back, I took a, an annual physical. After, after the, the doctor calls me up and said, hey, George, how do you feel? I said, I feel good. I play golf three times a week. The other days I walk around the block, I feel good. I said, why are you asking? He says, well, I, I, uh, I, your blood test shows that you lost half of your blood. I said, Whew, well, what are we going to do about that? He says, well, you got to go right over to the hospital right now and get a refill. I went over to the hospital and it took me all day to get a refill. I said, what's next? He said, we're going to find out why you lost all this blood. So they did another few tests. And they said, you have colon cancer. I'm telling you, when you get told you have cancer, it changes your life. You look back at all the things that you accomplished, but you also look back at all of those things that you wanted to do, but you just didn't get around to doing them. And you say, you know what? If I get another chance, I'm going to do these things. I'm going to do them bigger. I'm going to do them better. And I'm going to do them now, not next year, not next month, not next week, but I'm going to do them now. I'm telling you, if you take that attitude in life, you're going to be a better person. You're going to be a better Rotarian. Your club's going to be better. Your district's going to be better. Rotary's going to be better. And the world is going to be better because you're going to be able to do things that you really wanted to do to make the world a better place. So if you really want to do something, you have to be able to take action and you have to take action now. So what am I doing now? Really now I spend most of my time helping to fund uh, primarily water projects, but I do, I fund other things too, but primarily water projects. So uh, many years ago when I retired, I took an adult education course on oil painting. It was myself and 25 ladies. And the teacher's up there and she's teaching me, teaching all of us how to, how to do this. Here, you put the mountain in here, you put this uh, trees in here. And at the end, she says, okay, here's where you put the lake. I said, so I don't have any room for a lake. So, but I, I didn't, so I couldn't put the, the, the lake in here. But I liked the painting anyway. So I said, well, all right, I, I like this. I like this idea. I like painting. It's a good hobby. So I, I'm, I'm painting and I'm painting and painting. And then all of a sudden, a few years after that, I'd never sold anything. It wasn't, it wasn't why I was painting. I said, you know what? I, I'm on Facebook and uh, I'm very active on Facebook. I got the, like the maximum amount of friends you can have, like 5,000. In fact, last week I had to get rid of my daughter because I got 5,001. She started crying. I said, okay, okay. I won't, I won't get rid of you. I'll get rid of somebody else. So she's still a friend. So I said, I'm going to put it, I'm going to take one of my paintings and I'm going to put it on Facebook. I say, here's the painting. So it's a pretty big one. And I'm going to frame it and I'm going to sell it. I didn't know what to say. How much to sell it for? So I said, this is $500. My wife said, you're crazy. $500. I said, $500. I said, if a buy, guy buys it, or any guy, a Rotarian buys it, take the $500 and put it into a water project. And, and I'll give the credit to the buyer. So he gets 500 uh, uh, points to a Paul Harris fellow. And besides that, I'll give him 500 recognition points. So with, when he buys it, he'll become an automatic Paul Harris fellow. I put it on Facebook. Eight minutes later, I get a message from a district governor in Texas. He says, I'll buy it. I said, whoo, I'm a professional. I said, this is good. So I, I ran out of the garage to get another penny. A few hours later, I sold that. I'm selling these paintings all over. I, I think my paintings are hanging now in like, I don't know, 25 countries, I, I don't know, all over the place. And, and, and I offered them to clubs and districts to, to, so that they could raise money, raise money with them. 
So it's really worked out and it's a lot of fun. So now I concentrate on, uh, on, on uh, doing pets. Why? Yeah, because everybody loves their pets. They love their pets. And if the, if the pet died, then, then they want to remember the pet. So, so that's a good way to remember the pet. They give the uh, paintings to their, uh, to their children, to their friends as gifts at Christmas time, whatever. Some people say, well, I don't have a pet. So what if you don't have a pet? Say, you, you, you know somebody who has a pet. So, so buy one and give it to your friend. So nobody can say no. So let me show you my little boy, my little boy Baxter. Who I, you know, he's very famous now on Facebook. Here he is. I paint with one flat palette knife, no brushes. They're 14 by 11 inches. They're unframed, they're oiled, and I sell them for $150. And Baxter talks. Huh? Baxter talks on Facebook. Oh, well, Baxter talks. I got a few people that I, I got this app that makes, makes them talk. That's good. So they said $150. And $50 is, covers my expense, including mailing. And $100 goes to the buyers, Paul Harris fellow. And I put the money into the into a water project for their credit. So I, I've I've done like 185 pet, uh, pet portraits. Now 30% of them are deceased. So it's a way of um, it's a way of raising money, and it's a, and it's a lot of fun for me. Let's say your club uh, wants to raise money for something. You just say, okay, we'll sell pet pet portraits. We we'll go out and we'll get all our friends to buy pet portraits and, and we'll raise the money. How easy can that be? I had a friend of mine uh, on Facebook from Missouri and he, he had a charity in his club that, that they supplied shoes to orphan children. And he, and he said, I said, if you get me five orders for pets, I'll, I'll uh, publicize it on Facebook and we'll get more orders. And we will, uh, and all the money, the net money will go back to you for your charity. He said, oh, that's a good deal. And he, I think in two weeks, he, he got 12 orders. So I sent him a check for $1,200. And it's, it's that easy. So if you, have, uh, if you have an interest in doing a pet portrait, <coughs> what's that? That's Silver Dollar. You did his painting a few years ago. He knows me. Yes. So you can do a pet portrait. You can, you can have, uh, I, got, I got actually another picture of Baxley right here, right in front of me. When I, every day I look at him. And uh, uh, you can raise money. You can have fun. If, I'm, if, you, if, uh, if you want to be my friend on Facebook, send me an invitation. And remember, life should be an exciting adventure. Thank you. George, that's, uh, that's applause and sign language. Uh, <laughs> if you want to ask him questions, please unmute. Um, he's got a great story to tell and you can ask him questions on any topic, um, even painting if you want. Um, he uses a palette knife. I don't think he covered that. He doesn't use a brush. Um, he did use, a, I think, a brush to begin with, but then he found out about using just a palette knife because he's lazy. He doesn't like cleaning brushes. <laughs> and now he's got his own brush on his upper lip there that he can use. Um, and poor Mary Ann, her computer keeps dumping her, it looks like. And our uh, Barry Gaynor, our governor-elect, keeps getting dumped. Or he had an interruption, so he'll get to watch this later. Um, Odette, I really would love to see um, some wa a water project or an orphanage project uh, with these paintings. We could raise some funds uh, for your orphanage or for your mission trip down to Haiti um, and then maybe tie in, split, split it between a well in the area you're going to go serve and get the um, uh, a Rotarian group down there or several down there to help with the fundraising and the uh, well production down there in Haiti in that vicinity to work together. Um, and maybe even Mary Ann's uh, club might help work with that too. And we could produce a water well or water production. You know, some of it's not a well, some of it's a water filter system for the individual homes. Uh, 
and one thing that happens is it, it also eliminates uh, human trafficking. When they eliminate the, ch the girls, they also get an education because they're not having to haul water or, or go for miles, missing school and getting picked up by traffickers or abused uh, because they're not having to walk for hours all day while the boys are in school or working. The girls are having to haul water and cook. And so like in Guatemala, Guatemala and the other Latin American countries and the islands, the girls are able to go to school, get an education, and, and not have to haul water all day for the boys and men. And they're not able to be captured, raped, and attacked because of that, because they have water and sanitation. So uh, Dad, if you want to open that mic up, maybe if, if you have an interest in any of this, we can work on it. Mike, open your mic. Unmute. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, what I um um where we are in Port-au-Prince, the the home has like supposedly has water supposed to have water in the mm -hmm. home. Mm -hmm. The setup is there, but maybe once a month <laughs> mm -hmm. you get the city water that comes. Mm -hmm. So what we have to do twice a month we have to purchase like two um call them they they come the truck we have to purchase two i don't know how many gallons i don't remember uh twice a month we have to purchase two to provide uh water in order for us to have water for the kids you know because we have 24 hours seven you know be between the food and the laundry and the cleaning so i don't have to tell you um, but as far as the well itself, I'm not quite understand. That would be a question for George. How does that work? Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? Mm -hmm. We're talking about grants now. We're not talking about like giving two or three little filters to a few people. Grants are big, you know, $35,000, $40,000. I learned pretty fast years ago when you, you get involved with a Rotary Club in that country, they want to, they oversee it, and then the offices change and, and it all falls apart. The sustainability is lousy. So what we do at, at, at my club now, and, and I don't really get involved with it too much now because I spend most of my time fundraising, but the, we work with what they call an NGO, a non-government organization, a charity. And they pretty much do everything. They go into the community, they get the community to buy in. They get the, uh, they tell, they, they find out what the community needs and how they're going to, to put a well in or in-house uh, uh, filters or whatever. That, that they do all of that work. Rotary, uh, our club uh, uh, outside of the country, it usually funds it. We get all the, the money. The club inside the country oversees it but that doesn't work out good unless you have an NGO that's really willing to do everything. We work in Peru primarily and in Guatemala, and they have, uh, we work with Water Mission out of South Carolina, and they have employees in those countries. And they oversee it, they oversee the project. They, after it's all set up, they, they have parts and things that, like that, that if something goes wrong with it, they give the education. They, you, I think you really need that nowadays. You cannot leave it up to the club in the, in the country you're working with, or even the country as in the United States that, who are just funding it. You just can't do that. You have to have a good NGO. But I think that um, also looking at working with your um, mission group, you know, your mission that you have, um, might be able, but I think also building and forging that personal relationship with you and the Rotary in that club, in that country too. Mm -hmm. You going ahead and building that relationship whenever you visit, and I know you've had visitation problems there with the riots that were going on, mm -hmm. and building those relationships when you go there and getting to know if there's a stability in the country 
in some of the clubs because I know that they do have some long-term governors there that have been there for years and some long-term officers there that have been there for years. Mm -hmm. So some countries they have constant turmoil because of wars and stuff and others that they had long-term uh, relationships and long-term clubs. I know Haiti had some long-term clubs that had long-term stability. Others countries don't because of the you know, Venezuela, constant turmoil and strife. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Melissa, uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Do you have any questions besides baseball? Uh, nothing I can think of at this time. <laughs> okay. Baseball, what's that about? I like football and basketball. Well, he, well he's a pro, he was a pro baseball player. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mary Ann, you're on for a second again. I know you're having intermittent outages. Um, do you have any questions for George? Mary Ann's in a different club than us. And she's been faithful coming on. <laughs> okay. Um, George, do you have any uh, parting salvos? No, it was a pleasure talking to you, and um, hopefully we can do some business in the future. Okay, great. Thank and you. I would love to have you on some time for a painting class, you yeah. know, giving, yeah. giving us some hints. No, not that good. Yeah. Ah, you yeah. would be surprised what you could, you know, uh, uh, we have vocational um, service that would be um, a hobby service. <laughs> Well, I love you, and I certainly enjoy every day. Right in front of me right here is one of your paintings that um, of the house. And um, every day when I'm laying in bed, which I spend most of my time laying in bed, this is in the recliner, I spend most of my day in bed, and I look at that other painting that was given to me that uh, Tweet Coleman, Dr. Coleman, bought for me uh, when she visited your home. And I, I lay in bed looking at that painting. So uh, you're in front of me all the time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one. And I'll try to get answers Thank for you. you. Thank Thanks you. for your Love time. You. Thank you. Love nice you. meeting you. Okay. Have a good day. And I'll see you, you too. Thank you. Bye.